Hi, this is Sue Glenn. We're going to talk about predator-prey dynamics, which is an exciting topic. Uh, this is for ecology class, and I am working off of uh, examples in the textbook Ecology Concepts and Applications. It's the eighth edition by McGraw-Hill Publishers, written by Manuel Moles and Anna Scher. And uh, this particular section of the, the textbook, chapter 14.2, goes over uh, one of the best studied cases of animal population cycles uh, that we have and, and uh, looking at uh, the dynamics between uh, the predator and the prey. And we're going to be talking about um, how these cycles are, are working uh, based on a long-term data set that uh, is just kind of amazing. It, it, it comes from the uh, trappers data from the 1800s. Uh, the, the Hudson Bay Company uh, had trapping records uh, throughout most of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. And uh, lynx was one of the animals being trapped. Uh, beaver were snowshoe hare were. So we have quite a historical record and ecologists were able to use that to estimate the relative abundances of Canadian lynx and uh, which is uh, lynx canadensis and uh, snowshoe hare, Lepus americanus. So here's a a uh, picture of Lepus americanus, the snowshoe hare. Uh, snowshoe hare uh, it, it has a white coat color, coloring in the wintertime. It turns to a brown in the summertime. Interesting thing, recently they've been finding that snowshoe hare have been breeding with different species and are slowly, uh, there's more and more of them that do not change to a white coat in the wintertime. And as climate changes and snow reduces, uh, that actually might help them survive uh, so that they won't be standing out as a white rabbit on a brown background in the wintertime. So one of the, uh, in the 1950s, one of the hypotheses that was proposed to explain cycles and, and changes in the abundance of the uh, snowshoe hare and the lynx uh, was produced, uh, proposed in 1924 by Charles Elton. And Elton proposed that it was because of sun, sunspot cycles. And he said that variation in the intensity of the sun could directly affect uh, the food supply that the hares were dependent on. And then if the hares were not doing well or they were doing better, then in turn their predators would, would um, respond to that as well because the snowshoe hare is their main prey. This sunspot hypothesis was rejected um, in 1937. Uh, it didn't seem to correlate at all. And then Moran, uh, showed that uh, also in 1949 that sunspots didn't match the hair population cycles. So uh, Keith then um, suggested that, uh, that we're really looking at an overpopulation uh, situation like you would find with uh, density dependent factors coming into play when you get a population above the carrying capacity. And so what he was suggesting that was when there was high population growth, uh, you'd get uh, diseases, you'd get parasites, you'd get um, psychological stress from being at high densities and that would lead to uh, nervous disorders which would increase your um, mortality rates and obviously if you have a huge population you have starvation due to reduced uh, quantity of food and, and eating a lower quality of food. Um, an alternative theory was put forth saying that the uh, cycles were instead driven by the predators. And that is that if you get more hares, you get more predators, more things eating them, and that would eventually uh, reduce the prey population. And none of these hypotheses uh, were, were clearly accounted for all the population cycles that they could see. And uh, the 10 year cycle is not likely to become better understood by further theorizing and said that really we needed some long term studies. 
And so uh, Keith organized these studies uh, and they went on for 30 years in North America and Europe. So we have a really good idea now uh, what's, what sort of factors and the complexity of the factors affecting these populations. This is a part of the data set and we can see across the x-axis we have the year. Uh, so we've got an impressive uh, timeline here. On the y-axis we've got a population size of the hares and on the uh, opposite y-axis we have the lynx. And so the hare are actually shown by the, the red lines. So the hares are the red lines on here and the links are the blue lines across here, which are lowered down, which makes sense. You, you don't have as large a population as of predators as you have prey. And so we can see these ups and downs in the hare populations. And we can also see, if we, we look closely, we can see uh, populations of the lynx going up and down. Um, some of them seem that the lynx are just a little bit behind uh, the hare population. So uh, at, at this point, we have the hare population peaking this year and then the lynx population peaking that year. Um, but all those lynx are eating those hares. And so we can see these um, impressive cycles. So we're talking about um, animals living in the boreal forest. Lynx and snowshoe hares, uh, they live in the boreal forests of North America. <clears throat> so they're, they're in the north and uh, the, those boreal forests, just as a reminder, <clears throat> they are dominated by conifer, coniferous trees such as spruce, jack pines, tamarack. But there's also some deciduous trees that lose their leaves in the winter, especially following fire uh, or in areas that get disturbed. Uh, things like balsam, balsam pauper, poplar, uh, aspen, and paper birch. And the, the uh, boreal forest snowshoe hares. Um, live in places where there's a lot of understory shrubs so there's a good dense growth of uh, cover so that the um, one the lynx have harder time seeing them and secondly the uh, the food supply in the winter is good where you've got lots of stuff low down to the ground and the winter food supply is the the one that they worry about the most so this is a picture of the, the understory in that uh, boreal forest. The uh, snowshoe hares obviously can reproduce just like rabbits can, and uh, they have a, 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 an ability to uh, increase their population, like doubling it in a year. So they can, if they can double their population, then obviously they're going to be eating uh, a lot of food. Uh, Keith and his colleagues saw snowshoe hare population densities of somewhere from 1,100 to 2,300 per square kilometer. That's a lot of hares. And uh, and the uh, fluctuations in these populations are just constantly going up and down. So uh, in some times they could be increasing 10 to 30 times over the years. And then uh, also even he saw some that were 100 times higher. Uh, so they're going up and down. And uh, we'd already talked about, previously, we talked about the mountain hare in Sweden. And uh, this can show those kinds of um, population cycles as well. And you can imagine when the population is high that they are uh, going to be eating a lot of food and uh, really destroying the vegetation. So the winters there are about six to eight months. And in the winter, they're eating the buds and the small stems of the shrubs, uh, things like rose and willow. And uh, when the snow piles up, they're able to um, hopefully access uh, the higher or the lower branches of the trees uh, so they can even eat the little twigs and the buds on the trees if the snow is deep enough. Um, and in some areas, uh, snowshoe hares have been observed to, to take uh, over 1,500 grams of food every day. And some of that gets wasted. It gets, it gets dropped down into the snow. And uh, so, the, you know, they're, they're kind of like cookie monster there with the cookie pieces flying. Um, but they found one study showed that a population of snowshoe hare reduced the food uh, from uh, 530 kilograms 
per hectare in late November down to 160 kilograms uh, by the end of the winter, late March. And uh, so you can imagine they are having food shortages. The other thing that they do is they affect the quality of their food supply. So a lot of plants, when they are being eaten, will actually produce chemical defenses. And uh, so they will increase concentrations of uh, terpene and ph phenolic resins, which are things that uh, reduce the uh, digestibility and the taste of the food for the hairs. And this is a long term uh, because these are these are trees and plants that some of these uh, trees are keeping their leaves from year to year this can last for years so it, they found that some of these defensive chemicals persist for two years after browsing by hairs so because of this they they have their food supply even further reduced and these plant defenses um, are basically these could be the timers that are causing these declines in the snowshoe hare population cycles we have these long historical records of the lynx and the snowshoe hare population cycles, but the lynx are only one of several predators. Oh, by the way, in this picture, we got the, the snowshoe hare. You can see him eating the willow branches here, the lower willow branches from the willow trees. Um, so there's a lot of other things that eat snowshoe hare, uh, goshawks, great horned owls. Uh, so there's there's predatory birds. There's uh, mink and weasels, long-tailed weasels. Um, red foxes and coyotes. You can see the coyote here. I found this cute picture. I thought you'd rather see a picture of a coyote. Uh, I found a little stuffed toy than, uh, than one with a, a, a snowshoe hair in its mouth. Um, but uh, these predators will also cycle along with snowshoe hare populations. Um, and the, uh, the coyote is like a generalist. So uh, he will probably take snowshoe hare, which is pretty big. They'll take a snowshoe hare when the populations are really high for the snowshoe hare. And there was a study, uh, Keith and, and Todd, uh, in 1983, they reported that snowshoe hares uh, made up over two thirds of the diet of coyotes in Alberta, Canada. So uh, we know that uh, predation accounts for a lot of the mortality of snowshoe hares. 60 to 90 percent of snowshoe hare mortality when the populations are big are from predators uh, taking them. Now even though the coyote is a generalist predator, the lynx is a specialist. It specializes in snowshoe hares. And here we can see this lynx family learning how to hunt their snowshoe hare. So lynx is a, a specialist. Uh, coyotes are also important. And uh, not only are they important to the snowshoe hares, but the snowshoe hares are important to them. So they find that when the snowshoe hare populations are increasing, the coyote and lynx numbers can increase six to seven times larger following increases in snowshoe hare populations. Um, however, they do, they do, um, they have different strategies. Uh, lynx kill more hares when the numbers of the link of hares are going down, whereas coyotes uh, do kill more of them when the numbers are going up. Uh, they also found that um, the number of, of uh, hares a day uh, for the coyotes, it's really early in the winter, they kill a lot of them and then they will hide them in snow banks and then they can go back all winter and eat them. They found the coyote uh, was able to eat them like four months they've been frozen in snow banks and they could go back and get them. Whereas the, um, the lynx are taking them uh, usually more towards the springtime. So, uh, so we know that pr predators are important to these guys. Um, and, but we also know that the impact of food availability is going to be important. And these are not mutually exclusive uh, issues. These are obviously um, uh, factors that are working together, which uh, you can think that if the hair are getting less food, 
then they are probably uh, going to be having their decline in population, but it also probably means that they are less able to run away from a predator. They're going to be weaker. And so uh, these things could be uh, working together uh, depending on whether the population of the hare is increasing or decreasing. So you can see if the population is, is uh, fighting with each other for food, then it might be easier for the coyote to walk in and take out some hare. Um, Charles Crabb and his students and colleagues uh, did an amazing long-term large-scale experiment to look at all of these different factors of uh, food and predation over an eight-year period. And uh, it was, uh, it, it's quite a, a famous uh, experiment in field ecology. So what they did was they took uh, one square kilometer blocks in undisturbed boreal forest and uh, they were, at least a minimum of a kilometer of parts. So they had all these areas that they were using for their blocks. And three of these blocks were controls. So uh, they were just leaving the predators and the food for the snowshoe hares alone in three of them. Then to see how, how much food was impacting them, they had uh, some blocks, two, two experimental blocks, where they would go out and give extra food, and uh, and they could uh, actually get like uh, fertilizer that they put in there so that the plants would grow bigger and faster. And then they had... Um, blocks where they built electric fences around two of them and that took out the mammalian predators it didn't it didn't keep out the hawks and owls but it did keep out the uh coyotes and minks and lynx and then one of those blocks got extra food so if we we look at the graph here we have the control where you've got a normal food and you've got all the normal predators. Then we have blocks where we've just taken out uh, the predators but we have normal food. Some blocks where we added in nu nutrients and extra food so that they were getting more to eat and then places where they were getting more to eat and they were getting extra food. And um, it's, it's interesting when you read about these experiments uh, that they they couldn't, um, they couldn't maintain these blocks. It was, it was remote. It was really hard to get to. Uh, it was really cold. Temperatures would dip down to 45 degrees below zero Celsius, which doesn't matter whether you're Celsius or Fahrenheit at that po point. And uh, so it was very, very difficult um, to check on them every day through the winter time. Um, but they did observe increases in hair numbers to peak um, and de decline. And when they put the fertilizer in, it didn't seem to have an initial uh, impact. Uh, so the, um, the numbers in the control plots uh, uh, didn't really, uh, they were going up and down. It didn't really matter uh, whether when they were up and high, whether they gave them uh, the increased 
food or not. I think it's pretty clear from the graph that uh, when you had both an elimination of your big predators and you had extra high quality food, you had the highest number of hares. And so um, you really, you, your food is going to increase your reproduction rate. So you're going to have more offspring. And so you're going to have more births. And then you eliminate the predator, you have lower deaths. And so it's the interplay of both of these things. So this is really showing us that um, that there's, there's a lot of factors that come into play in controlling these uh, populations and, uh, and resulting in these cycles in the populations. So we know that sometimes we can use uh, mathematical models in ecology to get an idea on the, how a population is going to change. And uh, we've also talked about La Covaltera models when we're t dealing with competition. Well, here we have La Covaltera model that is looking at predator prey. And when we deal with the predator prey model, um, we, we call the, the prey the host. So it could be like a host to, to a predator, but it also could be a host to a parasite. So it's a little bit of, of terminology there. And instead of looking at too many things at once, the mathematical model is quite simple. It's just basically looking at the population size um, and the impact of predation on it, as opposed to all the different factors and seeing if we can find some, some interesting patterns. And so uh, we look at the change in the population size over time. So uh, change in population over time. And uh, so the population is going to be the population of the host in this case. So this is the, the uh, prey. And it's going to equal the exponential growth, so it's the growth rate of the prey, the host, times its population size, that exponential growth there. But um, it is going to be reduced by predation. So this term over here is going to be based on the predation. So that's in part uh, looking at the predation rate times uh, the population size. So the more you have in your population, the more likely the predator is going to get some of you. And also the more predators there are, so that's what the NP, the more predators there are, they're more likely to get you. So we've got exponential growth opposed by the rate of uh, predation or parasitism. Um, and uh, it's also, that's going to increase by the number of hosts that you have, so the, your population size and the population size of your predators or your parasites. And here we're just dealing with the, the prey at this point. But there's a second equation that would be the predators one. So with this one, once again, we have the change in the population size of the predator over time. So we've got uh, that dn of the predator over time and that is going to um, that's going to be dependent on uh, how how much energy it's getting out of the um, out of the prey and so you have this conversion rate here where um, there's a conversion factor, and that's the rate at which the energy in the prey is converted to offspring in the predator. And so uh, we have this um, conversion factor in here, and then we have the population size of the prey, which is the N sub H, and we have the population size of the predator, and then we also have the um, death rate of the predators. So um, it's it's not quite as elegant a, a equation, but it really does have some interesting behavior.
So if we look at these equations uh, together on the same slide, you can see we have the host population, which for the example we've been talking about have been the snowshoe hares. And then for the predator population, like the lynx, uh, we have the equation down here. So we have an equation for each species separately. And obviously they're both dependent on each other. So the um, host population is going to depend on the predator population and the predator population size is going to depend on the host population. So, so once again, like we have looked at these before, uh, when we did competition, we can look at the population of each species in relation to each other uh, when we looked at species space. So if we look at the top graph here and the x-axis is showing time, we have the predator and prey populations. And so uh, if we look at the uh, prey population, uh, so the snowshoe hare population, uh, it'll when the population is low, it'll start growing exponentially. And as it grows exponentially, we can see the predator population will start to, which was low, will start to eat them. And then they will produce off more offspring the next year. And they will start to consume them to the point that when the predator population starts to get quite high, uh, you're consuming faster than they're reproducing. And the prey rot population will start to drop. So we get these, um, ups and downs. If the prey population uh, is starting to is starting to decline like over here, then the predators are not all going to survive and their population will decline. So you get these ups and downs. So the bottom graph is where we actually uh, look at that species space. With increased predation, you get more um, when you have more predators, more predators, higher exploitation rate, which eventually reduces your host population, which reduces your po predator population. So you get this feedback. Um, I'm going to look at that bottom graph on its own in the next slide. Okay, so let's look at this uh, species space here. We've talked about species space graphs when we were dealing with competition, where you have the population of uh, one species on one axis and the population of the other species uh, that's not prey we actually call that host right is host and the x-axis is the population size i mean they do this right the population size of the predator okay it's hard that they both start with the letter p so Let's take a look at uh, if we have a population where there is lots of prey. So uh, if we're over here and we have tons and tons of prey, then we can look up here and we can see we're here on this graph. And if we have lots of prey, and here's the predators, over time, we can see the predator population is going to go up. So we move up to this point. The predators have gone up, which means that the prey population is not going to be stable. The prey population has dropped down. So it went from this point at time one to that point at time two, but the predators went from point one time one to time two. As the predators continue to eat more, so let's just go up here to time three, the prey population you can see has dropped substantially right there. So now we have less prey. What's going to happen to our predators? Our predator population is going to drop. So the predator population starts to go down for the next time step. And that'll slow down um, your rate, but your prey population is still dropping. So as we go to the next time step, the predators have dropped. This would be time step four. The predators have dropped and so have the prey at time step four. 
Now, as the predator population continues to decline, here we are at number five, the prey population can start to recover. So by the time we get to point five, time step five, the prey has gone up to that point. So I know I'm making this a little messy. So we had, we went from one, two, three, four. Now it's starting to go back up again. And the predator population uh, is very low. So the prey population at the next time step, if we go down here, the prey population is starting to go up. So this is going to be number six. But the predator population, there's just not very many prey there. And it's dropped down. So at any population size of predators or prey, uh, they could be actually going up or down. So let's just say I have an intermediate number of prey. And just if I look at one snapshot in time, it could either be a low population or a small or a high population. And whether it's going to be increasing or decreasing is really going to depend on where we are in these cycles, which were over there um, on that time graph. So if I have uh, an intermediate number of prey, I could either be at a point where the population is going down, or I could be at a point where the population is going up. And it just depends on where you are in those cycles. So this quite simple model um, actually produces oscillations in the two populations. That, that sort of tilted ellipse will uh, let you model these oscillations but as we saw in reality, the oscillations are much less predictable than that. Um, and uh, so one of the things that's missing from this model is the idea of carrying capacity. And we know food is important to these uh, snowshoe hares. And so there, there's going to be um, other factors that come in. But even given that, it's given us um, uh, insights into how these oscillations can occur and that uh, looking at this aspect of the interactions between the different species is important. Um, in order to uh, see if these oscillations make any uh, real sense, uh, there were a series of lab experiments that have been done to see if they can replicate these oscillations. Okay, this is a, an experiment that was done at Kyoto University by um, Utika, Utida in uh, the 1950s. And he was looking at the Adzuki bean weevil. So Adzuki beans are the, the red, sweet red beans uh, used in Japanese um, desserts. And uh, they get, uh, they, they will lay their eggs on the beans, these weevils, and then the little larvae will hatch uh, on the beans and feed on them and then they will eventually emerge to pupa and then it emerges into adults that look at new beans, look for new beans to lay their eggs on. It takes about 20 days for a generation um, for these beetles and then the uh, for these weevils. Uh, but then there's also these parasites which are these wasps who uh, look for the larvae, they're parasitoid wasps, and they lay their eggs on their larval weevil larva and uh, and then when those eggs hatch they eat the the weevil and uh, produce uh, an adult wasp. So when we see when they they were growing them in these little dishes. And this is this is absolutely amazing that they were able to get these oscillations, just like we saw these oscillations with uh, a snowshoe hair and lynx. We get these with these guys as well. And uh, he followed these uh, for several. Remember, a generation is is 20 days. So he did an experiment where it went for 940 days and they were still like oscillating, still living there. Um, and then he made a mistake and the population died. So then he did it again and it went for 82 generations, which was, was uh, 1,640 days. And then this is showing you his longest um, 
experiment where the population uh, lasted for 112 generations, which was six years, and then it was accidentally destroyed. Um, but uh, we see these cycles. So if we look, we've got the the host, which is the bean weevil, are the are the black lines on here. So we've got the host going up and down. And then the parasitoid wasps are the red lines. And so as the parasitoid wasp populations get high, the weevil populations are low. And then the parasitoid wasp uh, declines and the weevil populations go up and so you get these periods where there's really high fluctuations and you get like periods where there's low fluctuations and so you get you get these different types of fluctuations but it's a pretty pretty amer amazing experiment that uh, he was able to keep going for for a long time in a fairly simple environment with just some some beans and water and these two species Uh, we also talked about experiments that uh, Gauze had done with paramecium, with uh, paramecium aurelia and yeast. And uh, he had similar things where, where uh, he lo looked them through uh, three cycles of these ups and downs. And, uh, and the population uh, uh, for three cycles only, it was a much faster cycling because they don't, they don't have as long to live. Um, but he did get projections just like you would get with um, like a Voltaire models. But uh, these sort of, uh, these were the exceptional experiments. They weren't the normal. Most attempts have failed. Most uh, lab experiments on this uh, have led to the extinction of the predator or the prey population in a very short time. And uh, in order to keep these oscillations going, uh, people found that they had to uh, generally provide the prey with some sort of hiding spot, some sort of refuge, um, <clears throat> which uh, so means that there's something else going on to keep these natural systems going. So we'll be talking about those, those refuges next. Before you go on to read about the the refuges in the next section of the chapter. Take a look at the concept review uh, questions at the end of this section. Uh, one of them is when the coupled cycling of lynx and snowshoe hare populations was first described, many concluded that lynx controls snowshoe hare populations. Why are lynx not the primary factor for controlling snowshoe hare populations, even though their population cycles are highly correlated? And then why is it not surprising that snowshoe hare populations are controlled by a combination of factors, food and predators, and not a single environmental factors? And then the third question, I think this is a really good question. Both mathematical and laboratory models offer valuable insights into the dynamics of predator-prey systems. What are the advantages and limitations of each approach? We talked about this when we're dealing with competition, talking about this now again when we're dealing with predator-prey models. So we'll see you as we talk about uh, different ways of hiding from your predators. We'll be talking about refuges.